Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Commonwealth Club. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion. As mentioned, I'm Janet Napolitano. I'm president of the University of California. I was formerly Secretary of Homeland Security, which I mention only because FEMA uh, reports to the Secretary of Homeland Security. So I did have a, yeah. a little experience with disasters. Um, and uh, with me, of course, is Dr. Uh, Lucy Jones, who is... Uh, a longtime seismologist for the U.S. Geological Survey and a research associate at Caltech and the author of this book, The Big Ones, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. Uh, and as we know, we live in a, in a world where we are beset with earthquakes and floods and tsunamis and hurricanes wildfires and erupting volcanoes. Um, and here in California, of course, we live with the knowledge that the big one could happen at any time. And uh, uh, we are living through one of the worst wildfire seasons um, in our history. Uh, as the founder of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society, Dr. Jones seeks to increase society's ability to adapt and be resilient in the face of disaster and dynamic changes in the world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jones. Thank you. So I've got some questions, and I'm sure the audience will have some as well. Um, uh, but let's begin with a, a little bit of uh, biographical um, uh, questioning. You've worked as a seismologist for the USGS for 33 years, uh, and uh, you continue to serve as a research associate at Caltech. Um, what um, led you uh, on your path to becoming an internationally renowned seismologist? <laughs> and the next question is going to be, what led you to write this book? So uh, okay. Um, it's actually confusion, and I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I was very torn between uh, the humanities and the sciences. So my father was an engineer and worked on uh, Apollo 14, and when it landed on the moon, I told him I was going to become an astrophysicist and live on the moon. At the same time, I found myself studying Chinese because my grandparents had been missionaries there. My dad had been born and brought up in China. I ended up... Uh, going and spending my junior year in Taipei and, and becoming fluent in Chinese. And I sat there going, physics, uh, uh, building bombs, hmm. and uh, maybe the foreign service and being a government bureaucrat. Hmm. And, and somebody con convinced me to go and take a geology class. And since I had uh, grown up hiking the mountains of the Sierras, and they said, you can become a geophysicist and go play in the mountains and get paid for it. Sounded like a pretty good idea if that would actually work out. And uh, I ended up reading the 900-page textbook in the first week because I couldn't put it down. I just had discovered what I really wanted. It was science that was applied. It was science that mattered to the world. I wasn't inventing the great newest equation, but I was figuring out what it meant and how the world worked. And uh, felt, you know, I thought I'd come and save the world, or at least the part of it stupid enough to live on the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all of us Californians. So. So, and so what led you to write this book? Well, after a career of doing this, and, and I ended up in a position where because I spoke a little perhaps closer to English than some of my colleagues at Caltech, when the media would come and talk to us after an earthquake, I was often the one that was asked to do it. It was also partly because I did not follow the scientific norm of always couching everything about my uncertainties. I would tend to make more definitive statements than perhaps many scientists are comfortable with, but it meant the media really wanted to talk with me. And I went through this whole experience of listening, you know, the disconnect between what people were asking and what people were thinking and what we as scientists knew and realizing that our science wasn't getting used in the way it could. And, you know, we have all these, you know, scientific articles, the information's all there, how come it wasn't getting used? Part of it's because it doesn't, it didn't connect with people. And this whole process helped me understand how much stories matter to people. We, we determine facts through the scientific method, but we make decisions 
with storytelling. And I needed to put the two together. So the book is the story of 11 catastrophic disasters big enough to really change the society they were in. And by experiencing what happened to those people and connecting it to the science, I hope to help people understand that we don't have to just accept the disasters, we can be preventing a lot of it. So um, so you, you said that you, there have been lots of disasters in the world. Yes. Uh, and, and we're not just talking politics, we're talking. <laughs> um, I, tr uh, I try to stay in the natural, natural realm to natural the degree disasters. I can, yeah. There have been lots of natural disasters, um, and you selected 11 because they changed society somehow. I, my requirements is they couldn't just be a really bad disaster. They had to have been something that really affected the fundamentals of their society. So I start with Pompeii, which completely eliminated a whole part of the Roman Empire, um, and end up with the Japanese Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Fukushima. The, the Fukushima nuclear disaster that, um, you know, is really changing how Japan deals with its energy issues, but it's also changing the role of women in Japanese society because of this really fundamental disruption that's happened to the communities there. So, but there would be more than 11 of those. I then had a second criteria that I needed to under, know there was something I wanted to say about the disaster. I wanted something that it exemplified something that I thought was important to communicate about it. So one of the um, really um, interesting chapters uh, to, they're all interesting, by the way. <laughs> but uh, one that uh, uh, caught my uh, mind was uh, the eruption at the Laki volcano in Iceland in 1783. Right. Yeah. So I don't think many people know about this. So my, may, why don't you walk the audience a little through the scope of this disaster? Uh, yeah, this is the greatest catastrophe in human history, at least counted from number of dead, which given that the country of Iceland only had 50,000 people at that point, takes getting beyond the country of Iceland. So it happened in the southeast, in the farmlands, uh, an eruption that went on for about eight months and eliminated, completely covered in lava, close to half of the cropland of the country. It was devastating to Iceland. They became a, a, a nation of refugees with no place to go. The whole country, uh, was affected by this, was they lost their food. Every bit of land was covered in poisonous gas so that all the land-based food was, was poisonous. And the only food had to come out of the ocean. Um, and they lost about a quarter, almost a quarter of their population to famine. And they lost uh, huge communities. People had to give up and leave. And, and so it was a huge migration. Um, they've, they've, are very fascinated with line, uh, lineage and genealogy in Iceland, but there's a lot of the records that don't make it past. You can't go back before Lockie because so many communities were so disrupted there was nobody left to record the, the deaths and, and the records break down. Um, so it's fundamental then, but it also produced a huge amount of poisonous gas. And that gas got, uh, it went through an eruptive phase that got the gas up into the stratosphere. And so it traveled in both the lower atmosphere and the stratosphere over to Europe, and it killed people across Europe because this is poisonous gases. And they didn't, they didn't know it was coming from Iceland. There was just this mysterious fever that people who worked in the fields were dropping dead. And uh, they, they, comparing death rates, they estimate 23,000 people dead in the, in the UK. Nobody's ever done the analysis for Europe. And, and then the gases that got into the stratosphere cooled the earth. And we had uh, a huge freeze and famine that developed over the next year in Europe. Uh, and that famine in France is considered a contributory, significantly contributory factor to the French Revolution. Uh, but then it also, you overall cooling of the earth, you cool the continents, you disrupt the monsoons. So the monsoons didn't form in Egypt, the Nile didn't flood, they had a famine that killed a sixth of their population. Uh, there were famines in both India and Japan. Now they do think there were other contributing factors. There was probably an El Nino that year, but um, 11 million people died from the famine in India and another million people in Japan. So however much of that you attribute directly to the volcano, it is without question many millions 
and that makes it the deadliest disaster in human history. You know, another uh, uh, part of that uh, chapter, and, and you have so other examples uh, uh, throughout the book, as, uh, some people just rise to the occasion and uh, uh, really deal with the disaster response. And so you had Pastor John Steinmusen, is that how you say Jon Steingrinsen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Pastor Jon, in Iceland they don't have surnames, so everything's done by first name, so you can just call him Jon. Mm -hmm. uh, pastor Jon was the pastor of one of the towns that was near where it happened, uh, really led his congregation to respond to this. As the lava was first coming through and they thought it was going to be overwhelming the church, he had a final day where he, he called everyone in on Sunday. They thought it would be their last time in their church. He preached a long sermon. And during the sermon, the lava stopped. Uh, they actually now think it like ran into a big enough river that it was able to freeze the lava and create a dam to divert the flow before the, the, the river had completely evaporated. But so he was credited as the fire priest, the one who stopped the lava in its tracks. Um, afterwards, he was fundamental to his community. It's like another year and a half, two years that they're all poisoned. His wife died from the fluorine poisoning. Um, he would spend his time running, you know, going and burying you know, his, this commitment that everybody who died in his parish would get a Christian burial. And there were, you know, he would, there would be weeks that he would be bringing 10 bodies back to the church. Um, and he went to, to Reykjavik and went to get aid. Um, and at the end, as they're starving to death, he led a group of people down to the coast to try and get some food uh, out of the ocean. They ended up coming on a, um, a, sea, a flock of seals and got enough meat to, to then survive through, through the next winter. So it's very clear that he held his community together. And he kept them functioning as a society. And because that's the core issue here. You even here, the deadliest event, 80% of the people in Iceland lived through it. What question is whether society would live through it. Are you going to be able to hold together as a community? I mean, Greenland lost its, its Viking population from, as it, it's more from an Ice Age sort of thing. But it, this could have destroyed the whole country. They could have given up and left. And it was people like Jon Steingrinsson who, who kept, them, kept them going. And yet, when you look at his reputation, Icelandic students are all taught in school, like we hear about Father Sarah, they hear about uh, the fire priest. And what he's famous for was his sermon stopping the lava, rather than all of that difficult work that he did for the next few years. But I would argue, and I, I argue in the book, that that's the more fundamental. It's how we deal with the aftermath of the disasters that really determine who we are. Another character, or another figure in, in the book is uh, the, the de Cavallo from uh, uh, Lisbon. Yes, uh, uh, the, he ended up being called the Marques de Pombal, right. uh, uh, Sebastião de Carvalho a Majo. I found the Portuguese harder than the Icelandic. Um, <laughs> But the Marques de Pombal um, was the prime minister of, uh, of Portugal. They had a magnitude 8.7. Most people don't realize that Europe has had an 8.7 that uh, destroyed Lisbon, uh, killed about a sixth of the population of Lisbon, destroyed basically... On All Saints Day, right? On, and that? it was on the morning of All Saints well, Day all during church. the church services in an extremely Catholic country. So this was, I mean, in, in, in 18th century Europe, we all knew, it was absolute, that disasters happened because God was angry at us. Now go read Psalm 18, the mountains quaked because of God's anger. And we, we just knew it. We needed a pattern to tell us why an event would come along and kill this generation and not that generation. And it had to be God's work. But now you've got this issue. This earthquake happens during the church service. All of the churches fall down. So the pious are all crushed in their pews. And the brothels were basically spared. Because they were up on the hill and they were wooden buildings and didn't get the amplified And the king shaking. was away hunting someplace. So the king had gone out, had left town, right. So He know, wasn't so pious. Uh, <laughs> no, he went to the early church service. Ah, uh, there you go. Right, so he had gone to the early service so they could get out, uh, uh, get out and go to their estate for the, the, the summer palace. 
uh, de Carvalho came along and rode out to where the king was. And he had, the king at this point was very dependent on de Carvalho. He was the prime minister. He really ran everything. And the story is, is that he saw uh, de Carvalho and, what do we do about this divine retribution? And, and de Carvalho's response was, sire, we bury the dead and we feed the living. And which to me is the most succinct description of FEMA's role that I have ever heard. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, and for emergency management now, I mean, that's the fundamental. In that aftermath, you've got to do that and keep society functioning. And he was extraordinary at it. He did a great job. He got things. He had complete plans for rebuilding Lisbon within a month. They got started in it with less than a year. Uh, and it made him so popular. So here's another, we weren't going to talk too much about politics, but one of the things I see looking over all of these disasters is the political benefit of handling a disaster well and the political consequences of not. So de Carvalho became so popular with what he did, he was able to get the Jesuits thrown out of Portugal and stop the Inquisition. He had been trying to get this beforehand, seeing them as the Inquisition really holding Portugal back, but his political clout out of doing this allowed him to accomplish it. And I think you look at the other extreme, and I've got a couple of examples in the book where governments have fallen because of handling things poorly. And I think you could argue that the 2006 midterms in the United States were affected by the poor handling of yeah. Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Uh, whatever our political ideology, the one time every one of us wants our government to be competent is in the aftermath of, an, of a great disaster. And if we're not competent then, it starts making us question the, the competency in other times as well. Indeed, indeed. And, and so as you go through uh, the book, and there are other examples that you, you provide uh, of that. Um, and, uh, well, you know, everyone in California knows about the 1906 earthquake, but very few know about the, the mid-19th century floods. So maybe you can talk a little about, about that. That was also an astounding story. Well, okay, that's, uh, that's I'll, I'll do that a little personally, right? So I'm a seismologist with the USGS. I led a program for the, my last decade of service um, to develop scenarios of our big disasters because the emergency managers were telling us we know we need to plan for this and we aren't sure what we're planning for. So we started with the big San Andreas earthquake for Southern California since I was stationed down in Southern California and um, this was a Southern California project and we created what was ended up being called the shakeout scenario which led to the shakeout drill and of course has had some quite broad impacts and was very well received. The next thing we did was go to look at a storm. And I went to the meteorologist and said, okay, so what's the worst storm that we know about in California? And I couldn't believe the answer. I mean, I'm a fourth generation Southern Californian. So we came here in about the 1870s, my first part of my family. I had never heard of the storm from 1861-62 uh, that um, flooded all of California. Uh, it put Sacramento underwater. Now, they remember it. If you go to Sacramento, if you ever see the Sacramento Underground uh, Tour, it's actually where they ended up raising all of Sacramento by 10 feet by just carting in huge amounts of dirt to recover from that flood and to not have it happen again. But it wasn't just a Sacramento flood. It was the whole state. Central Valley became a lake that was 300 miles long and up to 60 miles across. Uh, the new telegraph lines that connected San Francisco to New York were all underwater and destroyed. Um, the damage was so extensive, it took a year for the state to figure out what had happened. Right. Um, many well, also because the communications because communications were, all disrupted, were gone. Right. Yeah, and by the time Cal Southern California started being hit, Northern California was already underwater, and they'd stopped talking to us. Um, the largest town between Los Angeles and New Mexico was completely destroyed. It was a town called Agua Mansa, which is peaceful water, which is sort of ironic. Ironic, uh, on the banks of the Santa Ana River and the floods that came down through it washed away every building. Um, there's another individual who did a special thing. The priest in that town realized what was happening, and the ch church was up above the town and not in the floodplain. And he rang the church bell and wouldn't stop until everybody from the... Uh, the town had gotten up to the church. The last few were reported as having had to swim to get there. 
And by morning, when they came back out, the whole town was gone. So, and that happened over and over and over again across the state. There are dozens of towns that disappeared. And, and, and it's so extensive, we can't even, we don't have full documentation. What we do have is that one third of the taxable land in California was destroyed by the event and was not paying taxes then the next year. The state went bankrupt. Uh, the legislature wasn't paid for 18 months. The capital had to abandon Sacramento because it was underwater. In fact, uh, Leland Stanford was inaugurated as governor in the middle of the storm, and they, tried, they decided to keep it at the Capitol, and he had to take a rowboat back from the Capitol to his house and enter into his house through the second floor window. Uh, and about five days after, they completely abandoned Sacramento and left. Um, it destroyed whole industries. It's a big part of the end of the mining. There was a short-term increase because the there was enough stuff washed away that new placers were found, but it was pretty much the beginning of the end of the mining industry. It was the end of the ranching industry. Uh, 200,000 head of cattle were drowned. 500,000 lambs were drowned. And so what had been the major industry of California was abandoned. They couldn't afford to restock the herds, and they turned to farming. And that's when California started to become a farming um, economy. And I see it as, there's a couple of things I saw to this. One, how, I, I can't see, how many of you have ever heard of the Great Flood of 1861-62? A couple. A couple, less than 10% of the room. How many of you have heard of the 1906 earthquake? Yeah. Right, exactly. And yet the damage from 1861 as a percentage of the state is substantially larger. And even if probably compared to the just the Bay Area economy. Um, and so but we managed to completely forget it. And there's a couple of things. There's one is what the psychologists call the normalization bias. We, we remember things that happened to us. This is this, we need stories. And if you don't have your grandparents telling you stories about the event, you've forgotten it, right? So we, uh, I had never heard of it. Most of the people I heard- They don't teach it here, no? They don't teach about it. And, and besides, who's afraid of the rain, right? So there's another aspect of it. The earthquakes are more frightening because you can't see them coming. But in fact, California has suffered substantially more from rain than it has from earthquakes. And most of us don't know that. The other thing is it's inevitable in the future. At some point, we're going to have another storm like that. And in fact, with the climate change increasing the energy in the atmosphere, energy drives storms and it makes the likelihood of these extreme events be going up. Uh, and yet, we don't plan ahead for it. Uh, we don't even think of it as a particular issue. So um, uh, in, in the book, you do uh, dive into kind of the psychology of disasters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one is uh, with earthquakes, for example, it's the problem of randomness, that right. the, the inability to predict when an earthquake will occur. Um, uh, the other, uh, another is the problem of empathy, uh, a tendency to, you know, blame the victim. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, another is uh, uh, the normalization uh, and, right. and, and that. Um, and, and kind of, why don't you talk a little bit about how you view the psychology of disasters and disaster response and, and as you've seen it over, over yes. history. Yes, so I started, I mean, that was part of the motivation for writing the book, was trying to express some of these... Um, what I, you know, things that I'd learned in the process of talking about earthquakes. Um, I mean, one thing, it's a, a bizarre part of my role in California, especially in Southern California. I get talked to after earthquakes. It's partly because I speak more clearly. But I think another part, I mean, many of the men will do the same thing I do, and people still talk about the earthquake ladies, right? There's, you know, and part of it's a little bit of, a weird gender issue. There's the seismologist and then there's the earthquake ladies. I've never really liked the term because of that. Um, but I think another part of it is, you know, why, why do you talk to, talk to a seismologist after an earthquake anyway? I give you a name, I give it a number, I give it a fault, and it says somebody understands what's going on and that makes it less scary. And there was a point at which I ended up doing an interview carrying my son because my husband's also a seismologist, and he handed me the boy in the middle of an interview. Um, <laughs> and I still have people asking me about this. And I would have people go, oh, you're the one who always brings the kids. I did it once, <laughs> right? And, and people still ask me about them. I'm like, 
yeah, he's been married for four years now, guys. It's been a while. Um, and, and why is that all of that? Well, maybe because you feel better when mommy tells you it's okay. And that whole thing of being a mother and talking about it, it was reassuring. And that was the point for me where I went, oh, this isn't about the science I think is really fun. This is about reestablishing normalcy. This is saying somebody understands it, so it's putting it back in control. And so it was sort of the first point at which I understood I started thinking of it in these terms. And the psychologists have shown us a lot of things about what makes people afraid of things. We're more afraid of things we can't see. We're more afraid of things that are unpredictable. We're more afraid if it feels like some, nobody understands it, if it feels like it's unknown to science, uh, and the dreadedness of the outcome. If it's a really awful way to die, uh, it makes us more frightening. And earthquakes, oh, and the other one is intentional, if somebody's doing it to us. So earthquakes hit everyone but that one. <laughs> but it's why we spend the amount of money we do on terrorism compared to the absolute risk right? Because it's so frightening to us right. to have it happen. And earthquakes fit most of those boxes. But when you really, this fundamental of not knowing when it's coming, and it's, as I started looking at it, one of this one of, you know, God did it to us. Um, that's a way of making a pattern. And what I was able to sort of work out in the process of writing the book is one, realizing our evolutionary need for patterns, right? We became human beings out on the savanna being chased by animals with bigger muscles and you know stronger muscles bigger teeth we survived because we had a better brain we could look at the issue make patterns and figure out how to put, make ourselves safe so we could watch the animal move and figure out that he was going in this direction and protect ourselves or all of those things of of recognizing that you know the waving grass was actually hiding a predator so we are deeply wired to make patterns in the face of danger because we can find a way to be safe. And that's really important in a lot of situations, connecting your gastrointestinal distress to the mushrooms you just ate. Really important in a lot of situations. The problem is we make patterns even when they're not there. Right? Think of constellations of stars. We, we do a really good job of making patterns out of random distributions. Right. And so what do you do when you face... I, and I've never kind of understood, you know, why that's the, the queen's belt or... The, yeah, know, the, yeah, the, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. So, I, but okay. we try to find the pattern anyway. Even exactly. though they don't really fit real well, we go for it anyway. And that's what happens with disasters. So I, I start with Pompeii. And you have this long tradition. It turns out the pagans looked at this and said, I got hit, you didn't, uh, the gods must, I must have gotten in the way of some angry gods, right? Vesuvius erupts because Vulcan, or Venus is cheating on Vulcan and he has a male hissy fit. That was the explanation for the volcano and it's sort of like getting in the way of those powerful beings and there's not much you can do about it, which probably des describes a Roman peasant's life with respect to the powerful people in his society, right? The Judeo-Christian tradition, they looked at this and said, no, God's good. God's somebody who you can make a covenant with. So if you get hit by a disaster, it must be your fault. And it was a way of, of rationalizing this. Everyone knew disasters were caused by angry gods. And trying to make God good, you have to then put the, the blame on us. And that's pretty deeply wired in our Western civilization. Now, Asian civilization doesn't have such a sense of personal sin. So they blame it on the government, right? For, the, for them, disasters happen because you've got a yin-yang imbalance. And the government, the emperor, sits at the interface between the natural and the celestial worlds. And if he is, his court is not in balance, it's going to be reflected. And so if you have too much yin, which is the earth, you get earthquakes. If you have too much yang, the male sky, you get hurricanes, right? So uh, an earthquake means that the emperor is going to die is the most common cause for an earthquake because that's the, he's the young and if he's dying. Um, so when the Tangshan earthquake happened and six weeks later Mao died, it was a really big setback for Chinese earthquake education. Um, and there was a pretty strong cultural thing that this had to have been related. And in fact, um, the country self-evacuated. And you talk about that in the I book. I talk it in the book, because yeah. I actually worked in China in 1979. I said I studied Chinese in college. And so I was there three years later. And 
I was told that probably half a billion people, about 500 million people, were living outside in the month after the Tangshan earthquake because it had killed hundreds of thousands of people and Mao had disappeared. Mao was so ill, he died just a few weeks later. And the cultural tradition says, if you know, the emperor dying is gonna set off earthquakes and maybe, there, you know, maybe that earthquake wasn't enough to, to accomplish the balance and half a billion people self-evacuated for, for weeks uh, in fear over that. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you uh, think of uh, you know, that kind of um, human instinct to find a, a pattern. Hmm. Um, uh, let, let's, let's go back to earthquakes, and maybe you can uh, describe for us why science has yet to find a, a predictive pattern for earthquakes. Because there isn't a predictive pattern. <laughs> and I, I think we have done quite a good job of proving that it's random but nobody wants to accept that answer. And I, I, that's, I said I was gonna go figure out how to predict earthquakes and save the world. We've been working at this for a while. And any time we think we find a pattern and we run the statistics to see if it's valid, it all flows away. Oh. And now you can make it look like you've got a pattern because in fact earthquakes happen pretty often and the small earthquakes are much more likely than the bigger ones. So you'll get a situation where somebody thinks he has a pattern and he says, I think there's going to be a magnitude 5 this week in this area. And then there's a 4.7 just outside the area. Well, that's close, right? That's got to count. Except that you're now allowing your result to determine your your definition of your box, and that really undermines the validity of the statistics. And by letting a 4.7 count instead of a 5, well, actually, there's twice as many 4.7s as there are 5s. So you've now allowed, you know, a, your, de your background, your random chance result is now much higher. And whenever we hold people to the statistics, they don't do better than random, right? Um, there, we do, do, well, on time. Spatially, we know where they're going to happen. They happen near faults. They're much more likely right here than they are in, in Nevada. And that's much more likely than it is in Kansas, except for where we set them off by doing fracking. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, Oklahoma should have about 1% of the earthquakes of California. And for a few years there in 2014, 2015, they were having more earthquakes than California. Wow. Uh, and that was all human induced. Um, I call them voluntary earthquakes. <laughs> I want to make sure it's clear what we're doing. Um, so we do know where they're going to happen. What we don't know is when. And um, this seems like it shouldn't be the case, right? Don't you, you have an earthquake because you push on the fault till you overcome the friction and it slips, just like snapping your finger. See, I slip on the fault and I produce energy in the form of a sound wave. Well, the problem is, is that you don't have an earthquake because you've exceeded the strength of the fault. You've exceeded the strength of the fault in some tiny place on it. And once it starts to move, the dynamic friction is much lower than the static friction. And then it can propagate through. And so, yeah, eventually you would build up so much stress on the San Andreas that you have to have the earthquake. But that's probably... 10,000 years from now, and by random chance, we're sometime going to have some little knob that exceeds the strength and it lets go, and you have the earthquake long before you've accumulated the stress that would be required. And so that, when does that one little knob go? That's a random distribution. And I think we've done a pretty good job of showing that's what's controlling the timing of earthquakes on human time scales. Um, on the, you know, Give me enough time, I can give you, you know, give me 100,000 years, I can tell you what earthquakes are going to happen in California. But what happens in your lifetime is a random subset of that group. You know, and, and we, we can't uh, predict within a human's lifetime when an earthquake will occur, but we can model the impacts of right. different strengths of earthquakes. Uh, and so uh, 
and and you've done some of that modeling, right. uh, and and in fact, you have a pretty scary <laughs> description of what would happen in Los Angeles. Um, you might want to talk about that. Okay, well, bit. in fact, so in the book, I include what we did with the shakeout scenario. Uh, you guys have actually had a recent, so the same. Pro my project at the USG has continued after I retired and just released the haywired scenario. So that's the same thing of looking what would happen to uh, earthquake on the Hayward Fault. We called it Haywired because it was a cool name, <laughs> and um, because it was also looking at the Im particularly at the impact on the on the digital economy. Um, so when you look at the issues, number one, you're probably not going to die. Um, the rate at which people that's die. That's good to know. Yeah. People don't believe me when I say it, but it's really true. Even those really bad earthquakes. Um, for the southern San Andreas, we estimated 1,800 dead out of a population of 20 million. Right? So you've got a 99.99% .99 chance of not dying. Um, but you have a really good chance of being bankrupted by it because our building codes are life safety codes. They say, if you choose to build a building that's so weak that it'll be a total financial loss after the earthquake, that's your decision to make. The role of government is to make sure you don't kill people in the process. So what the building code does is give you the minimum that you have to do to make sure you don't kill somebody. But the reality of the way in which we build buildings and developers and somebody develops a building, if he builds it stronger than that, he's not getting his money back. So he, he really can't go and build it stronger than that. So it's become de facto become the minimum. And um, that means that when we have the big earthquake, uh, the estimate for haywired, for so magnitude seven on the Hayward Fault, 25% of the modern two codes, so the, the buildings built after 1997 to the most modern code, 25% of them will not be usable after the earthquake. Wow. And that's got huge financial incomes on everybody around you. And that, in fact, is a, is a life safety issue, too. We, part of what happened in, that led to me wanting to write this, I got to go to New Zealand after the Christchurch earthquakes. And they, the chief resilience officer of Christchurch took me to meet various people who had been through the event to talk about it and to give us stories. It's like, I know you scientists don't like this part, but you need to think about the stories here. And um, there was one man who was vehement. You've got to stop considering life safety as only what happens in the event. That his brother had uh, lost his, all his property, was bankrupted by the earthquake, and committed suicide with a year later. And another relative had, was so stressed out by it, his chronic diseases got worse and he died. And that there, you know, what you're hearing in, in Puerto Rico, 4,000 plus people that have died since the event because they can't get the electricity back. And so this idea that all that matters is what happens at the moment is driven by our ran fear of randomness, our fear of that unknown, when is it all coming out from under me? It becomes the only part we get to think about. And we've got to really shift it and think about the earthquake is there's a few people who die here and then there's all the rest of us who have to live with the consequences of it and live with damaging, uh, damaged economies and struggling activities. And you know, think about what si San Francisco was in 1905. It was the only city that mattered in California. And the decade after the 1906 earthquake is the greatest growth decade in the history of Los Angeles because people gave up on San Francisco, the new people coming to the state didn't come here. And before that earthquake, San Francisco was five times larger than Los Angeles. And now Los Angeles is five times larger than San Francisco. So and it could happen in reverse when we have our earthquake. So is this another way of thinking about resilience? Um, and uh, you know that resilience as a concept is not just how you survive the immediacy of a disaster, uh, but um, how the community uh, comes back and recuperates and, and rebuilds. Right, and I think that word community is the most important part of this. Right, we, again, in, you look at the messaging our government gives us about disasters, there's a lot of individual stuff. You need to have a kit, you need to have a plan, you need to take care of your family, nobody's gonna be able to help you, you've gotta be there. 
Right? Well, there's an implicit message behind that, that it's a very isolating message. And you can hear it that your neighbor has the potential for becoming your enemy. And we see that in people who get obsessed about getting ready for events and insist on having guns in their earthquake kits and that the most, you know, it's all going to be about social breakdown and you have to defend yourself. But we sort of contribute to that because we, we talk about it as individuals. People stay in communities because of people they care about. And I'm actually, I, you mentioned that I, I I started this center, so I have a, a nonprofit center I started since I left the government. And one of the things we're focused on is trying to create um, approaches for community organizations to become resilient and be ready for disasters, because that's how I think the community is going to survive, is because people care enough to stay. Now, there was, a, there was a story I heard from Katrina, and I couldn't track it down completely, so it didn't get into the book, because I wanted to be sure I could justify anything I said. Um, but I was told that there was a study done of what neighborhoods recovered in, in New Orleans. And the best predictor of a neighborhood coming back was that they fielded a Mardi Gras crew. And that, that, that they thought it was probably two issues. One is that organizing volunteers to create a Mardi Gras float is a lot of the same skills you need to get things working right after the event, of how to organize people and get supplies. That are. But the other part is it means you had a reason to come back. You had people you cared about and were close to. And that's what I think California has to worry about. You know, especially as a Southern Californian, we don't do community really well, right? We're sort of famous, we're transient. Well, let's pick up and leave when life becomes difficult. You know, how many of you are going to stay here when you haven't had a shower in a month? Because our water is going to take six months to get back to all of our houses. Yeah. You are going to stay here because there's something worth working for that's going to make it worth trying to find some other way to get a shower. And I think that's those community organizations are, are a key to that piece. Um, but I think it's going to take a shift in mindset. We can't be focused on response. We really have to think of this larger picture, and we have to think about it through communities. Um, so when I was uh, uh, Homeland Security Secretary, and uh, as I mentioned, FEMA reports up, up to the Secretary of Homeland Security, there was a huge tornado in a, uh, that went... Joplin? Uh, no, uh, Greenberg, Kansas. Oh, yeah. Um, and this thing was like a bulldozer blade... Uh, but it was almost two miles across, and it just flattened this town. Uh, and so uh, they lost a lot of their housing stock. Um, uh, their, their schools were uh, destroyed. Uh, you know, everything was impacted. And the community came together, and they, first of all, they kind of made a pact that we're going to rebuild our town. Uh, and, and they identified the two things they needed. One was they needed uh, school to be open, uh, and the second thing was they needed a grocery store. Yeah. Uh, and so that the normal patterns of life could be restored, um, and then they could build out from, from there. Right. Uh, and, it's, and, it, and it was really a dramatic illustration about what a community can do when it makes these collective decisions. And I think there's another piece that we were sort of edged on before and didn't quite get to, but it's here is important. That fear of randomness, when we want to come up with a pattern that makes us safe. And now we've, I, I can't tell you when it's going to be. You can't find a way to make sure it doesn't happen to you. Well, when you see, I th and I saw this most clearly in Katrina, when we saw, as a society, what happened there, I think we were all appalled. Seeing those people who were, you know, herded like cattle, you know, the treatment of people in the Superdome, or watching people drown on the roofs of their own houses. And we needed to find a way to think that wouldn't happen to me. So there was a chunk of people who said, I mean, there were sort of two things. It was all FEMA's fault, right? Or it was the victim's fault. And we turned pretty quickly to how awful those people were. And the, dis the various stories of lawlessness. Most of, when I went and did the research, it, 
they weren't true. They didn't stand up to it. Um, and yet we uh, looked at that situation and made it their fault because we didn't want to think that it could happen to us. And I think there's a couple of different stories in there where, and this is not just in America, the faced with the awfulness of it, we have to find someone to blame. And uh, blaming the victim as their fault or turning on the outsiders. Um, and I, I see that, well here, I'll, let me step back. As a scientist or as an engineer, we all see that systems fail when they're weak, where they're weak. You know, the levee that's already damaged is the one that breaks. The, the unreinforced masonry building that was, you know, um, is the one that's coming down. It also applies to human systems. So human systems fail where they're already weak. And uh, you look at the 1927 Mississippi floods, which are the story in the book, the, the racism of American society made the whole thing a lot worse. And I think that gets repeated to some extent in Katrina as well. And what we need to do to be resilient for disasters is gonna make us a better community too. Mm -hmm. And part of that is caring about our neighbors, even if they don't look like us. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a few que we've got a ton of questions, uh, and and I've got more too. But um, I give long answers. That's a problem, isn't well, it? <laughs> yeah. Um, here's, here, this one uh, s sort of relates to what you were just saying, which is uh, um, given the lack of research on the aftermath of natural disasters and the increase of vulnerable populations, how can we uh, uh, begin the process of planning for those with special needs at scale? Oh, and which oh, entity oh, should, oh, should take the, the lead? You've got a major problem there because uh, I'm not sure I have the answer to that one. You've hit a lot of important ideas there. Um, and we are greatly increasing our vulnerability uh, because we're putting more people in cities. And the cities, life in a city is much more dependent on engineering systems. You know, in 1906, when the earthquake happened and you lost your sewer, you built an outhouse in your backyard. Now, losing the sewer system for, for the Bay Area could be a public health nightmare. And so there's a, there's a lot of vulnerabilities by being in cities. And Another important piece is that disasters are not equal opportunity offenders. The poor suffer more. The poor are going to be in, in substandard housing, in more vulnerable situations, have less resources to deal with the recovery, which is really the important part. And um, it, it's a huge challenge, and I can just say the only thing I can think of is that we've, we need to be helping people not be so vulnerable in the first place. And, and that's back to this, you know, what makes us more resilient is going to make us a better place as well. And I think part of it is recognizing our interconnectedness. I th you know, one of the challenges for Americans is we, we, we are all descended from people who were so independent that they put themselves in front of their family and clan and left. Right? So we, have, we are selectively descended from people who are individualist and a bit selfish. Right? Um, and so we struggle to help the larger community. And then you take in a Puritan uh, cultural aspect that wants to blame the victim um, for anything and, and the, the psychological need to do it in the face of disasters. We aren't, um, we, I, I think that's our fundamental challenge is we have to care about each other more before the earthquake. Right, so um, you, you uh, uh, in the book, I'm hopscotching around, but you um, uh, discussing a, a pretty extensive planning exercise you went through in the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, so, what was that about, and and how did you incorporate yeah. ideas of, like, for example, vulnerable populations? In, okay, in that's actually a good one. Yeah, um, I had the opportunity after Mayor Garcetti was elected in 2013. Actually, we were looking at what was happening in San Francisco, the CAPS program, the Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety. And we decided we, I was 
I had a friend who could get me an audience with, with or an interview with uh, Mayor Garcetti. Tell him about the CAPS plan and, you know, try to get a little city rivalry going. And you really don't want to be completely eclipsed by San Francisco, do you? You know, can't we, we do something about it? And um, he was like, great, I want to act on it. Um, but I'm not taking 10 years. We've got to do it in a year. And I'm like, <laughs> there's a reason it's taking 10 years in San Francisco. But we ended up negotiating a thing where I, as a USGS employee, spent a year at City Hall in a partnership. Very important. I didn't work for him. So I didn't have to, you know. So then when I went and talked with people, I wasn't politically controlled on what I was saying. And it made it the whole thing much more credible. It was a risk on his part because he couldn't control what I was saying. So I think that was political courage on his part. We considered a wide range of things within the city, and I think that's the place where I came to recognize just how much the pre-existing social conditions matter so much for people. So, for instance, one of the things we were doing, you know, um, communication after the earthquake is going to be a really big deal. The power is almost certain to go out. Cell towers have four hours of backup power. Getting any more than that requires generators, and nobody wants that in their backyards. So... What are you going to do with you only have four hours of communicating? What's, how are you going to get your business re-going without internet? Without, you know, there's, there's just all sorts of stuff that, that comes into that. And um, what we ended up doing was combining that with a social justice issue that had been important to the mayor of trying to get, um, um, you know, the right to information. So he wants, he's trying to create a citywide Wi-Fi uh, that would bring the internet to everybody. And... Um, if we set that up with solar power for all of the Wi-Fi you know, systems, we can keep communication going that'll replace your cell phone or at least can, you know, you can at least get text messages through, uh, through the Wi-Fi system if we can keep that up and going. So I think we're looking for opportunities like that. But the other big issue, and it's, you know, we already have a horrible affordable housing crisis. And the housing most likely to be destroyed in the earthquake is the affordable housing. Mm. It's where you're, especially the software story, especially in Los Angeles, uh, those are all rent controlled affordable housing. And if we lose all our affordable housing in the earthquake, we're not getting our economy going again. So it's, so we were able to actually do it as a social justice, let's improve this situation and make the business argument that it wasn't just you know, that it was, it was good for everybody to make sure that that happens. Um, and I was pretty impressed at his ability to, to pull those things together. Yeah, so one of the, the, the questions um, uh, from the, the audience, and uh, if I can uh, read the, um, uh, the question, is, is how do we um, more completely integrate into property valuation the valuation of risk um, and so that uh, um, people are, it's not just the immediate value, but kind of long-term value in, in, in the face of the world we live in, right? One way, of course, is to just have more science literacy among our population. The information is out there. The California Geological Survey has a wonderful website that gives you the hazard zones. You're near a big fault, you're near an active fault, landslide risk it's as an earthquake hazard, so it could be triggered, uh, and liquefaction risk. And you can get down to the parcel level and see whether or not your parcel is in those zones. And you could make a choice about buying that parcel. You know, I've got some friends who were asking me for help, and I was like, take this tool, look at this. And it's like, oh my God, I didn't know it was there. So part of it is we need to make sure that the information is there a bit more correctly. I think the other really big issue is how poorly we handle insurance. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few ways to screw that up. Uh, the flood insurance program, I think, has not been the most successful, of course. So some major floods in the 50s, it ended up with FEMA, it was before FEMA was established, but it got incorporated in FEMA. We have the National Flood uh, Insurance Program. But the way it was implemented, it ended up being that basically the government subsidizing building and flood plains. Right. Because we build where you were. Right. Because you're getting the, you know, these government subsidies. You know, people couldn't get insurance, so the market was falling apart. So the government stepped in, provided insurance, and it now meant you can get insurance on property that really probably shouldn't be developed. Uh, and 
the way politics works, we haven't been able to solve that problem, even though it's a well-recognized problem. At the other extreme, you get what's going on in, with earthquake insurance, uh, where most people, how many people here have earthquake insurance? Yeah, that's about the same as Reckitt knew about the 1861-62 earthquake. I do have it. Um, and as a society, the lack of earthquake insurance is going to be devastating. Uh, especially because we've got this life safety building code that says it's your problem if your building is, has to be torn down. You know, in Christchurch, New Zealand, in their earthquake in 2011, they used the same code. They probably have the same implementation. The building code did just what it was supposed to. Nothing collapsed. They had to tear down 1,800 modern two-code buildings after that earthquake. And they are recovering because they have 95% insurance coverage. Uh, what's going to happen to downtown San Francisco when one quarter of these buildings are no longer usable. And those are only the new ones. The old ones are worse, right? How do you keep your economy going and all of that? We should be having insurance, right? P if people had insurance that could come in and do this, we'd be okay. Of course, the insurance companies go, I think you've got a lot of risk. We've got to, and it's the shared risk. It's the fact that it's, it you know, happens over time. I mean, it all happens at once and you go 50 years without it. Uh, Having California Earthquake Authority, I think, has been a good step that way because as this, this quasi-public-private partnership and they can keep on investing the money and build up the fund. And they, have, they now have enough money that they could handle two 1906 earthquakes uh, with their existing reserves. Um, but nobody buys it. Right? How come mortgages require fire insurance and don't require earthquake insurance? They, they're the ones who are going to hold the back on this. And I actually asked Wells Fargo, I had the opportunity to be with some senior management, and why are you guys doing this? And they were like, because we can't change it on our own. If we require earthquake insurance, we just won't get the market. This is gonna, we have to scare enough people together that all of the mortgage companies decide to do that. And I think it will happen after the next earthquake and a couple of banks go bankrupt, and that tends to be the way in which we, we come to these sort of decisions in the United States. Right. Um, but there, if we actually had earthquake insurance, and the rates were really dependent on how your building was built, so you would get an advantage to building a stronger building, we could be making much more rational decisions. Right, so, um, so here's a, a question. If you could recommend one uh, step or action for people to prepare for a natural disaster, what would that be? I'm only allowed one, huh? I think I yeah. put five in the book. It's in the last chapter. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, one of them is understand that the damage is not inevitable. Every time I've bought a house in California, I've actually, we moved a certain amount, so I've had four different times. The first thing we did is bring in a foundation specialist to look at the foundation and tell us what we could do to make it stronger. Not was it up to code. What could we do to make it as strong as it needs to be? I've never spent more than $1,500 in that process. You know, they tend to be pretty cheap things that you can do. Um, and that's recognizing that you, you're responsible for your own buildings. The only thing the government has done is try to make sure it doesn't kill you, and that's only as good as the building code that was in place when your building was built. So, and to the degree it was enforced without any corruption whatsoever. Um, <laughs> so, you take responsibility for your own buildings and try and make them as good as you can. The contents of the buildings, too. Another thing is education. You know, we're all terrified of earthquakes. How, much, how many of you had thought about worried about your flood risk? <laughs> Actually, San Francisco doesn't have a lot of flood risk because you're up on the hills. Uh, if you're living out in the Central Valley, you really should be taking your flood risk a lot more seriously than you've been doing, probably. So getting yourself educated, there's really good materials. Both NOAA and the USGS have hazard maps, and you can educate yourself about it. The next thing is, is do this with the people you care about. Do this with your church, with your synagogue, with your school, wherever you connect with people. Making everybody stronger, you're going to have a better relationship now, and you're going to all be able to help each other afterwards. So, why, um, 
and this is another question from the audience, but um, we had a series of hurricanes in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think the response to uh, the hurricane in Puerto Rico was uh, handled so poorly in comparison to those in Texas and Florida? Number one, it was a much worse hurricane, all right? So here's a problem. We have one number for the hurricane, category four, category five, which tells you the maximum wind speed at one certain place. It doesn't tell you how many people got subjected to that high wind speed. So yes, Hurricane uh, Irma was a category five. It was actually the longest sustained category five winds we've ever recorded. But when it came into Florida, there's one place in the Keys where it crossed over, but it crossed over perpendicularly, so it moved relatively quickly through. And then it went up the West Coast. So the warning had to be for the whole state because they could be, it was a very big event. But most of the state got category one or less winds. So that's just not that bad, right? Whereas, so Maria is now a category four. Of course, it came in after Irma, and they had that level of damage from Irma first. The category four literally ran down the spine of the island and subjected everyone to much more extreme winds than, than anybody but the, a couple of keys got in Florida. So we want to think of them as the same, and they're not. And so understanding that scientific difference is important. That said, um, so there's physical differences. There are preparatory differences. Florida has finally figured out that they have hurricanes and in general have done more uh, than a lot of places in dealing with it. Um, and Puerto Rico has, I said, the poor suffer more. They don't have the resources. They already had an inadequate uh, electrical system. It had real problems. There's a variety of reasons for what they do, but it's long term. They have a lot less money to, to be able to cope with this. Uh, and then I think the third thing, the response um, wasn't as strong. And But you know, one of the things is for all FEMA gets the blame, that's really not FEMA's role. FEMA's role is to provide money to the states to do their job. Right. And in fact, emergency management, is a, the, philosophically, it's bottom up. You start with your incident commander, and he needs help. He, when he calls up, he, he hands over both responsibility and authority. You know, so when he hands, hands it up, he loses authority, but he also hands over the responsibility. And so you've got a pretty good reason for trying to handing it up. I, they, Hurricane Katrina is rather famous that New Orleans wouldn't hand it to the state because the two of them were politically fighting so badly. So there are dysfunctional ways to, to, to mess that up. But primarily, that's, and the, the county is the primary response entity. The state helps them work with it, and then the, fe the feds fund the state. So, you know, if the state isn't ready to receive it, you know, that's a major issue as well as what the feds choose to do. Now, there are times where the feds go, I know you aren't really ready, but they can't move in without being asked. Now, they were asked in Puerto Rico, and they didn't respond with as much as they might have, I think, for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's, it's not just the social lacking of our response. So we've been talking about natural disasters um, I prefer staying there, but okay, what do you... <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, uh, there are quite a few questions from the audience for man-made disasters, and particularly those related to climate change. Uh, so uh, can, can you kind of talk us through from, from your perspective as a disaster specialist, uh, wh what you see is happening and, and what we should be doing? Because, yes... Uh, as a disaster scientist, as a, 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 as, a, as a geoscientist who studies the physics of the world, um, I hope there's, climate change is real. Uh, climate change is, is reached the point that we can't go back. We, it's gonna take a long time to get enough carbon out of the world and cool, out of the air and cool us back down. Um, so it's gonna be getting worse. And, the first prediction of climate change is that 
heat is energy. More energy in the atmosphere is more energy available to storms. So our expectation, and we're starting to see it, is bigger hurricanes. Um, Tornado Alley has gotten bigger. Um, the, the California uh, winter storms, these really devastating winter storms, are probably going to get more extreme. At the same time, we're probably going to have more extreme drought. Now, modeling that the whole world is warming up, that's pretty easy. It's extremely conclusive. It might have been subject to some debate when we first started talking about it 25, 30 years ago. There's, there's no debate now. Um, getting down to any individual place, that becomes a much more complicated picture. Um, you know, we have some really hot times. I think we're probably going to get more monsoons coming into California because we're, we're heating up the ocean. Um, but at the same time, you know, we might end up that, that Southern California ends up a little bit cooler because when it gets really hot in the central U.S., we often, it develops wind patterns that get that cool us off, you know. So there will be winners and losers in the climate change picture in terms of heat, and it gets difficult to predict. So one of the ways they do it is there's like 20 different big scale models. And if 19 of those models are showing the same thing for a particular area, we, you know, we think it's pretty good. Um, an increase in extreme heat days is highly likely for California. Extreme heat days being defined as above 95 degrees and that that can, you know, plenty of places and like, you know, not the extreme, not San Francisco, but um, San Fernando Valley, they're expected to increase by two months a year and ex of more days above 95 degrees. Um, so that sort of scale and that leads to wildfires. Um, and there's a very fundamental issue. Our wildfire, our, our forests, evolved for the climate that was here 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It's not varied that much over the last few millennia. Um, it is now warmer. These trees are no longer perfectly adapted to the climate that they're experiencing. And you can see the dead trees if you go up in the Sierras. I was just up in the Southern Sierras and found, you know, maybe 30% of the trees were dead at the elevation of about 5,000 feet. They're going to burn. Well, they all, and right, that's a natural process that always happened. But now the forest that will come back is not going to be the same forest that was there before because it's no longer evolved for the current climate. So we're going to be seeing significant shifts to our ecosystem. And those shifts happen through traumatic events. And usually in ecosystems, it's usually wildfires. But I would expect we're also going to be getting more floods combination of wildfires and more rain, we're going to be, or more in intense rain, we will be seeing more debris flows. All of those are absolutely in our future. And of course, sea level rise has impacts. And even if it's not that big, you then, the storms have bigger impact if you've now, because, you know, you now get much more coastal erosion because of it. Um, things are shifting, we are going to have to adapt and we're going to have to put in, I think, a lot more effort to general resilience. And so, as I said, one of my big things that I want to try and do is really develop approaches to help community organizations be ready for a variety of disasters because I, I, I see those as the, the entities that are going to help keep our communities together. You know, and one example of that, oh, we're, we're out of time, um, but briefly, um, uh, one example of that is Fukushima, where you right. tell this very compelling story of these three women who uh, were impacted by the events there and what, what they did in terms of community. Right. I, I can't complete yet yeah, tell all their stories, but I, I had the opportunity, I was brought in, act the... That earthquake and tsunami happened in an area that was very traditional, where women had really pri quite prescribed roles, where uh, the eldest son lives with his parents till they're dead. So you marry an eldest son, you're now living with your in-laws until you're 70. And uh, these men have had a hard time getting married, actually, because of that. So there's, <laughs> a, now, there's, a, and there's a bunch of foreign wives that are legally Japanese, so they weren't even recognized as foreigners because they'd married a Japanese. It's, it's a... And, they were so disrupted, you know, when 10, 20% of the population died and all economic activity is gone because everything is swept away by the tsunami, um, people were in such shock. And it, in many cases, it was the women who stepped up and tried to help their community. And a group formed to support women trying to be entrepreneurs. And I'm like, women entrepreneurs in northeastern Japan? And, and they, but they're doing it. 
And, and they can do it because, so when you have a really fundamental breakdown of society, it is also an opportunity. And I was inspired visiting there to see the positive turn that was being taken on it and how lives were being improved in the face of, of huge uh, losses. And yet, um, they're, you know, they're doing these things. One of the women there this was, uh, has been trying to help people exposed to radiation from Fukushima be able to know what they've been exposed to. She ended up, she went from being a stay-at-home housewife to the leader of a major nonprofit that's providing non, you know, uh, radiation uh, testing and, and training for, for the community. And um, I sometimes have a hard time saying this without getting choked up. I asked her what she wanted people to know. And she said, I want to be able to look back in 20 years and know we did more than was needed for the children. Because to look back and realize we hadn't done enough would be unbearable. And I think that's sort of, we got to think about that with climate change and what we're doing to our children. And we have to do something about it. Well said. The book has got lots of great stories <laughs> in it uh, about disasters defined as in for the purposes of the book as those that have had some changing of society impact. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Jones, for well, thank you. Uh, being here tonight. I'd like to thank our audience here and on the radio, television, and the internet. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that copies of Dr. Jones' book will be available for sale in the next room uh, immediately following this program, and she'll be pleased to sign them for you. So I'm Janet Napolitano, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. <laughs>